Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. We are in our study of Dante's Inferno and we turn now to Inferno 2425, Cantos 2425. We are in Circle 8, Bolgia 7. This is the Circle of Thieves and the Pit of Snakes. Now, there's reasons why at this point in our study, usually, students begin to say, I'm starting to get a little bit fatigued. And I think that there's a reason why then the passage that we will call the up on your feet passage is such an important passage. Then, students will often say, how can Dante one-up himself with all these punishments? And then they hit Cantos 24 and 25 and the great pit of snakes and the transformation that takes place. And all of a sudden, Dante is in a whole other world. He transcends any poet who came before him. Many argue he influences and transcends any poet that came afterwards. Certainly, T.S. Eliot thought so. We'll spend some really interesting to, um, uh, uh, we'll spend some time with some really interesting uh, uh, concepts at the conclusion as we get ready to talk about Kafka and metamorphoses and, uh, and and some other concepts. Now, at LearnStrong.net, we have our earlier lectures. My assumption is you've been working with the Iliad up through St. Augustine's Confessions, and we also have given individual lectures on all of the preceding 23 cantos. Let's work through them really quickly just to remind ourselves, and we're going to do this very, very briefly, just to remind ourselves of where we've been. Canto 1, Dante meets Virgil. Canto 2, Virgil says, I'm from Beatrice. Canto 3, the inscription of hell abandoned, hope all you who enter here in the uncommitted. And Canto 4, limbo, circle 1, that's where Virgil himself lives. Canto 5 begins the, uh, the area of the, uh, the incontinent. In Circle 2, the Jacked Lovers and Francesca. Canto 6, Circle 3, the Gluttons. Canto 7, Circle 4, Prodigals and the Avaricious, as well as Canto uh, Circle 5, Styx, the Wrathful and the Sullen. That's interesting because we're going to have the Wrathful and the Sullen. Here we're going to have the Thieves, and we're going to have some similarities between the two. You'll see what I mean. Canto 8, this is the Styx, Felipe Argente. Canto 9, the Gates of Dis are opened by an angel. Canto 10, we will have Dante's conversation with Farianata and Cavalcante. Can, uh, Canto 11, Virgil gives a map of the rest of hell. And then in Canto 12, we begin with the violin. Circle 7, round 1, violin against neighbors. Canto 13, circle 7, round 2, violin against self-suicide. Canto 14, ring 3, circle, uh, um, circle 7, violent against God blasphemers and um, and Capacius. We're going to come back to Capacius actually in this um, in this in this Cantos 24-25. Cantos 15 and 16, circle 7, ring 3. Those are the Sodomites. We've explained how Dante and the Catholic Church saw any sexual act that was not devoted towards procreation as somehow being unnatural. Canto 17, Circle 7, uh, Ring 3, the violin against art, these are our users. And then they jump on Gerion's back to write down to Circle 8, the uh, Malabouge, and starting in Canto 18. Here we'll have Bol uh, um, the Bolge number 1, Pandora Seducers, Bolge 2, the Flatterers who swallow the poop because in life they spoke poop, BS, in other words. Canto 19, Circle 8, Bolge 3, Simoniacs. Um, Canto 20, Bolgia 4, fortune tellers, and this is like Tiresias is there with their heads turned around and they're crying because they're sad. They can't see forward, now they have to see backwards, and of course they cry and so the tears run down through the cleft of their buttocks and all of that. Cantos 21, 22 is Circle 8, Bolgia 5, these are the berators, and uh, again, you've got, the, uh, you've got the farting demons, right? The joke of all jokes. Canto 23, we have uh, Bolgia number 6, these are the hypocrites who wear those heavy robes and um, Caiaphas who will be crucified on the ground. Which leads us now to Cantos 24-25. Some of my students have said, without question, this is the most compelling lines and disturbing lines of all of the Inferno. I'm going to leave that one to you, but the hope here is you read this material on your own and then use me to help you. Our learning theory of connecting new information to old information in meaningful ways, hypercritical for our study. Our three levels of annotations at level one, what does the text say? At level two, what does the text mean? To A, themes, messages, to B. Symbolism and irony is where we'll spend our time. We're going to see a whole lot of that here. And we're going to comment on Dante as poet, politician, as well as philosopher. And we're going to see a lot of a lot of ideas that will be presented here. One of the things about Dante that I continue to be amazed by, and students will report as well, is how regularly he seems to be able to come up with something, boy, I didn't see that coming, kind of concept. Finally, at 3A, how can I relate to this information? 
especially how can I relate to other texts that I've been working with, and finally, how can I relate to me personally? A real brief summary of Canto 24, 25. We see them together, which is why we'll treat them now together. Dante is, in the beginning, Dante is really tired because he's gone up this, this uh, you know, climb and he barely got away and he's tired, he's done, he's ready to sit down and be finished, echoing sometimes the sentiments of students who have worked through each one of these cantos. And they, they, they admit, they say it all out, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of with Dante the Pilgrim, I'm a little tired. And we're going to get that famous up on your feet passage that we'll mess with. Then we're going to get into below, uh, uh, below uh, um, seven, to, uh, pouch number seven. The thieves, and they're stuck in a snake pit. Think about, for those of you that know the, the old film Indiana Jones, and, um, and the, the very first one, um, where he falls down inside of that thing, um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is the film, and he falls down inside, and there's snakes everywhere. That will be uh, motivated, that scene actually motivated from this scene. Um, and then finally, we're going to see thieves that are transformed and attacked by the snakes, and then become, in some ways, the snake, and the snake becomes the thief. It's, it's a, I mean, it's, it is compelling in every way. Let's just now turn to Cantos 24, 25. And I know I say this, guys, to you every time, but I'm serious. you gotta, you got to love the language of, of this poem uh, now, starting in um, Canto uh, 24 and 25. In that part of the young year when the sun goes under Aquarius is to rinse his beams. Uh, we're talking now about the time from roughly January 20th to February 15th. And the long nights already begin to wane toward half the day. And when the hoarfrost mimes the image of her white sister, Snow, right, upon the ground, but only a while because, it, because her pen, it seems, is not sharp, long, a peasant who has found that he is running short of fodder might rise and go outside and see the fields have turned to white and slap his thigh, we saw that, didn't we, in the Aeneid, for example, frustration, and back in the house, pace grumbling here and there like some poor wretch who can't see what to do. And then he goes back out and finds hope back within his reach, seeing in how little time the world outside has changed its face and takes his crook to fetch his sheep to pasture. It's an amazing introductory set of lines that simply says, at a certain time of the year, when the uh, rancher would like to be out, we know this because of where we live, would like to be out working, instead he's stuck indoors. But finally he figures it out. I felt this way, Pilgrim Dante says, dismayed by my master's stormy brow. You'll remember at the very conclusion, da uh, Virgil, the last canto, Virgil's mad because um, he, he discovered that Malcota and the rest of those demons lied to him, right? He can't believe it. He can't believe he got due. And quickly as this, the, the hurt had found its plaster. In other words, right about the moment that Dante the Pilgrim starts to get worried about Virgil, he gets this as his solution. For when we stood before the ruined bridge, my leader's face turned to me with a sweet expression, the same as I had first beheld at the mountain's base, right at the very beginning of our poem. In other words, Virgil is able with a face of encouragement to help Dante say, come on, come on, we can keep going. He opened his arms after he took some time to consult himself and study the ruin well. And taking hold of me, began to climb. So we've, we've got this climbing now that starts to happen, which is going to mirror in some ways the climbing that we will see in Purgatorio and Paradiso. So write that down. But now we're beginning to climb. Before we were going down. Now we've got to climb to get out of here to get into the next pit. As one who works and reckons all the while seems always to have provided it in advance. So lifting me up one great boulder's wall, he kept his eye on another eminence, saying, Next, grapple that one. But make sure that it will bear you first. In other words, he's helping him to climb. That path of stones would not provide a road for those who, were, uh, who wore lead mantles. In other words, those guys that we just saw who were wearing those heavy good ropes, they would have never been able to do this. For we, he weightless I helped up, could barely make our way from spur to spur. Had it not been that on that bank the slope was shorter than on the other, I do not know how he'd have fared, but I'd have had to stop and would have been defeated. In other words, he says, if it had been even more of a difficult climb, I wouldn't have made it. This is a rough climb, a climbing going up. But it was true in each valley that the contour of the land made one side higher and the other low because of all the way all Melabolge inclined downward toward the mouth of the lowest pit at length. We reached the place at which we found the last stone broken off, and there I sat as soon as I was up. So out of breath were my spent lungs. I felt that I could get no further than I was. So let's get the picture here. In Canto 24, Dante the Pilgrim has done his climb with Virgil as a help. 
But he's, he's, he's had it. He's done. He's exhausted. He's seen a lot already, and he's had it. Down he sits. And of course, these are lines that I referenced in the opening of our Inferno review to Inferno, and now we'll come back to it. First, we're going to listen to Pinsky's translation. Then we're going to listen to the great poet John Ciardi's translation. That's the one that I challenge you as AP students to memorize, because I'm pretty convinced in the course of your life, you're going to find moments like Dante the Pilgrim where you're ready to sit down and just call it good. Be done with it. And you'll need to hear these lines. Let's now go ahead and work, first of all, with Pensky's translation of this. His is brilliant as well. To cast off sloth. Now, this is Virgil speaking. This is Virgil's exhortation. To cast off sloth. Of course, sloth is one of the uh, seven deadly sins, right? Now well behooves you, said my master then. For resting upon soft down or underneath a blanket's cloth is not how fame is won. Without which one spends life to leave behind as vestige of himself on earth, the signed smoke leaves on air or foam on water. So, stand and overcome your panting. With the soul which wins all battles if it does not despond under its heavy body's weight. And still, a longer ladder remains for us to climb. This is not enough climbing. We got more to go, obviously. Uh, Purgatorio is coming. To leave these shades behind does not fulfill all that's required. If you understand me, come. Act now to profit yourself. That's his little sermon. Let's go, let's go. Show me that you understand what I'm saying. I got to my feet, showing more breath than I felt, and said to him, Go on, for I'm strong and resolute. Now that's Pensky's translation. This is the one I want you to memorize so that later in your life you're able to recite it when you find yourself really tired. Up on your feet. This is no time to tire, my master cried. The man who lies asleep will never waken fame in his desire, and all his life drift past him like a dream, and the traces of his memory fade from time like smoke in air or ripples on a stream. Now, therefore, rise, control your breath, and call upon the strength of soul that wins all battles unless it sink and the gross bodies fall. There is a longer ladder yet to climb. This much is not enough. If you understand me, show that you mean to profit from your time. I rose and made my breath appear more steady than it really was. And I replied, lead on as it pleases you to go. I'm strong and ready. Fundamental lines, no question, to see Dante's Divine Commedia as a pro produta, lines like this obviously ring out. In other words, now is the time for us to get really serious. We've made it this far, but we have more to go. Don't give up yet. It's significant <laughs> that we in AP study these lines about halfway through our AP curriculum. It makes sense. Right about the moment we start to feel a little bit tired, Mr. McGee sometimes has to play Virgil to his Dante the Pilgrim students to say, we have more to do. There is a longer ladder yet to climb. This much is not enough. Back to Pinsky. And so ascending the ridge, we took our way. It was quite rugged, narrow, and difficult, far steeper than the last. To seem to be not too fatigued, I was talking while I trudged. In other words, okay, I'm going to prove to Virgil that I'm, I'm, I'm okay, even though I'm not, I, I, I'm going to talk. When a voice arose, one ill-equipped to say actual words, we're back to this thing about language in the inferno often is language which is not clearly representational, right? From the new foss we had reached, in other words, I heard something that's coming. I don't know what it said, though I was now at the high point of the bridge, which overarched the ditch there, who, but whoever spoke from below seemed to be moving. I turned quick eyes to peer down into the dark, but the bottom didn't show. Whereof I said, Master, pray, lead from here to the next bell, and let us descend the wall, just as I cannot decipher the things I hear. So too, I look, but make out nothing at all. From where we are, I'll give... No more response, no other response, he said, but do it, for fitting petitions call for words, or for deeds, not words. In other words, he says, great idea, I'll, let's go. Where the bridge's end enjoins the eighth bank, we descended, and then that pout showed itself to me. I saw in its confines serpents, a frightening swarm of weird kinds, such as to remember now, still chills my blood. Imagine 
millions of serpents slithering on top of each other. This is a scene that some of my students have said, okay, 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 I have to stop now because this is going to give me some nightmares. Why? Well, it gets better or worse. Let Libya boast no more of her sand so rich in reptiles, for though they spawn, and now we're going to get a list uh, from, from Dante, the poet, showing us that he knows all different kinds of snakes. The first one, the Cherylidid, uh, which is, uh, 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 is going to leave a trail of smoke, supposedly. Um, Centris, um, which is uh, always um, um, uh, moving in a single straight line. With Amphibjina, um, the two-headed snake on either end. The Jaculi, which supposedly can fly. The Ferrari, which plows growths um, 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 in the earth, gro grooves kind of in the earth, right? She never, though one include all Ethiopia and the lands that lie on the Red Sea, has shown a pestilence so numerous or of such malignancy. In other words, you'll never see all of the horrific snakes in one place that I saw. Amid this horrid, cruel, grim, and dense, people were running naked and terrified without a hope of hiding or a chance at heliotrope for safety. This heliotrope uh, is the bloodstone which could cure snake bites supposedly and even make one invisible. No, no, in other words, no way to get away, right? With snakes that thrust between where the legs meet, entwining tail and head into a knot in front. In other words, these snakes not only are there, not only bite, but also grab hold of and begin to kind of transform. And look, I mean, Dante, the poet, is having a bit of fun here, obviously. And look, at one near us, a serpent darted and transfixed him at the point where neck and shoulders joined. One of the snakes attacked one of them. No O or I could be made with strokes as fast as he took fire and burned and withered away sinking when the snakes bite then up in smoke go the uh, go the individual and when his ashes came to rest ruined on the ground the dust spontaneously resumed its former shape in other words over and over again we have metamorphoses transformation that will be happening and now we're going to get what you could predict the phoenix here right um, um, that, that, that can't shock us from um, Ovid's metamorphosis uh, 15 right the phoenix in its flames, great sages agree, to be born again every 500 years. During its life, it feeds on neither grain nor herb, but a moment and incense and, 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 and incenses tears. And at its end, the sheep is shrouded in its essence of nard and myrrh, as one who falls and knows not how, if a demon pulled him down, or another blockage human life entails. And when he rises, stares about confused by the great anguish that he knows he feels, almost like an epileptic seizure of a kind, and looking, sighs, so was that stranger dazed when he stood up again and was like, whoa, whoa, what happened? And then, oh power of God, how severe its vengeance is to have imposed showers of such blows. My leader asked the shade to tell us who he was. And now we're going to get this uh, interesting exchange with uh, Vanni Fucci, um, the illegitimate son, the mule of uh, Franco de la Razia, um, who was a black Guelph of Pistoria, and he's now going to tell a little of his story. My leader asked the shade to tell us who he was. The time is brief since I rained down from Tuscany, he replied, into this gullet. It was a bestial life, not human, that pleased me best, mule that I was. I am Vanni Fucci, beast, and aptly enough, Pistoria was my den. Um, notice the word den here, and we got all these snakes. And, Master, please bid him not slip away, but ask what sin it was, I said, that thrust him to this place. I mean, good heavens, this has to be some horrific sin that would bring him here. For in his time, I have known him as a man of blood and rage. In other words, Dante goes, I know this guy. The sinner, who had heard without dissembling, turned mind and face, which shone the color of shame to me. Then he declared, now we got Vanni Fucci's uh, famous prophecy now here, that you have caught me here amid this creek causes me suffering worse than I endured when I was taken from the other life. It's worse for me to see you in this, say, in this state than for me to actually be in this state. That's what he says. Wow. I cannot refuse, he says, your question. I must be thrust this far down because I was a thief who took adornments from the sanctuary, for which another falsely was condemned. We're talking now 1293, uh, 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 Vanna stole um, sacred relics from a church, and for that now, here he is, right? But 
Lest you delight too much in what you see, if ever you escape from this dark ground, open your ears to what I now pronounce and listen. So here we go. We're going to get the prophecy right, and it's going to be the prophecy of exile. First, Pistoria strips her land of blacks, that is to say the Guelphs. Then Florence changes her citizens and ways. From Valdemarga, Mars draws a great vapor, and thick clouds muffle its turbulence, till stormy, bitter, impious war breaks out on Campo Piscino, where suddenly it breaks through and tears the mist and strikes at every white, obviously, um, uh, Guelph, and I have told it to bring grief to you. In other words, uh, I can tell you what's coming, and what's coming is going to be brutal. Now, of course, Dante, writing after the fact in exile, he's going to obviously explain in some ways then through lines like this why it is that he was exiled. But notice the power of this. You've got this thief that says, don't delight too much in what's going on here because we got, you got, you got some, some of your own that's coming. Canto 25. If you need... A term for this one, it's the lines that Kurtz will give to Marlowe in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, his last words, the horror, the horror. I like what Pinsky has to say about this so much that I'm actually going to just turn to his, um, to his little essay on page 339 and read it. It's brilliant writing. I mean, Pinsky, such a brilliant poet, but he writes in prose so beautifully. The notion of horror, as we find it from fiction or the movies, involves detailed uncanny transformation of the human body with erotic and moral overtones, the overwhelmed state, I'm sorry, the overwhelmed stare of the zombie, the flickering eyes of the aroused mummy, the elegant neck bite that changes the virginal heroine forever, Jekyll or the werewolf helplessly becoming stronger, hairier, more animal, the hunger of George Romario's living dead, relentless and contagious. The body may be snatched or bitten, invaded or, inv or inverted or duplicated, obscenely revived.